Oil makes up the largest portion of our energy use, so oil alternatives were the place to start. For 30 years, the U.S. has been the leading producer of biofuels. Hey, Scott. <laughs> hey. You ready to take a ride? You betcha. What do you got here? Well, it's, it's my secret. I'm, I'm, <laughs> we're going to tie it on the tractor, and we're going to go out, and I'll show you what we're going to do with it. <laughs> you got me a little worried. Yeah, yeah well, so let's put it on the bucket. All right. I'll, I'll a little bit. There you go. Let's, let's get on right. we'll go. I'm going to let you let's drive. Let's do it. Oh, good. Yeah. Well, serious, yeah. <laughs> we, we may never get there. Crank it up. Watch your dog. Okay. Okay. Right. <laughs> How many gears does this have? Uh, about, I don't know, 16. Oh, good. I think biofuels, it's the easiest thing to do because it's most similar to petroleum. We're used to it. And put in combustion engines. So we don't need that many changes. The United States has used corn, but the problem is you got this big, huge plant, and all you're using are those current, little tiny corn kernels. So you're actually just using the food. <laughs> it doesn't make sense yeah. in many ways. You know, not only is it competing with food, which you know, raises some moral questions, but it tends to be much more energy intensive than other ways of growing biomass. It tends to have a much larger carbon footprint and it uses much more resources, fertilizer and other stuff. Okay. So ideally, we want to move to a next generation of biomass material. In Louisiana, they're already growing this next generation of crops. But will they be a better feedstock than corn? Boy, this is a... Amazing root system. Kind of give an idea how tall it actually is. This is a 20 foot pole. The other day I kind of I measured it was 18 feet. Now, how long have these been growing? Well, they were planted in uh, in May, middle of May. Of which year? <laughs> this year. <laughs> May of this year. Yeah, this is a uh, Jack and the Beanstalk territory here. And we're in September now. Yes. Now, what is it? I mean, what are we looking well, at? Well, it's, it's a hybrid sorghum. It's uh, bred especially to, uh, to make cellulose. Okay. And the cellulose is going to be broken down into making uh, ethanol. If we look to the future of biofuels, we need to use better feedstocks. Right. We should not, in my opinion, be using a lot of food to produce fuel. Yeah. Right? And so we need to learn how to turn lignocellulose material the structural material of plants into fuel. So the actual stalk. The stalk, the leaves, leaves, some of the roots, and so on. Right. It seems cellulosic crops can be very productive on farmland and in a warm climate. But what about where conditions aren't so ideal? New York State is not a corn-producing state. We can produce trees quite well, and we grow a lot of the perennial grasses quite well. So if you're looking for a national initiative on biofuels, you need to be looking at feedstock availability across the country, not just what we have in the uh, Midwest or the Southeast, but how all parts of the country can play in this initiative. Mm -hmm. Can I pull one? Oh, yeah. Is that all right? Yeah. It's pullable. Uh, well, they're pretty oops. tough. Broke off. Yeah. <laughs> Switchgrass is just one of a number of perennial grasses that we can grow in agriculture across the country. And so why not look at different possibilities? So you're saying these kinds of grasses can be grown in places that just don't make sense for food crops? Mm -hmm. What yeah. we typically call marginal land. And okay. we've got no shortage of marginal land in this area, which is why you see the, the, the changes in agriculture that we've seen from, yeah. from a lot of small dairies over the years to, uh, to a lot of land that's just sitting idle. So far, cellulosic crops look good high yield per acre, on marginal land, and in different climates. But what about turning them into fuel? What we do in this laboratory is very much about microbiology, using microbes to do the conversion of sugars into biofuels. So there's sugars in this fibrous cellulosic stuff. Yes. And you're trying to liberate it. Exactly. OK. OK. The challenge, though, is how do you liberate those sugars in a very cost-effective way? 
Now, I can look to you dead in the eye today and tell you we can make ethanol from cellulosic material. Mm -hmm. It's a no-brainer. We know how to do that. I can't tell you for sure that we can do it economically. It's one thing for me to say I can do great things here in the laboratory yeah. with my yeah. reactors. Yeah. I've gone from this to that. <laughs> exactly. But it's another issue to really scale this up into uh, hundreds of thousands of gallons, millions of gallons. Yes. So now there are some demonstration scale facilities, you know, a few million gallons a year, 10 million, 15 million gallon a year facilities, you know, pretty in an energy sense, very small, right? You know, we're talking now, I think this year, the US produced 25 million, 30 million gallons of ethanol from cellulose. Okay. You know, compared to 10 billion yeah. right. of the corn ethanol. If I'm hearing you right, Dan, one of the great challenges then, as with most things energy, is scale. Just the scale of taking a low density fuel, a crop, and converting it into a high density liquid. You know, for bioenergy, scale is exactly the challenge, is exactly the problem. And because we use so much energy, it's, it's mind boggling how much energy we use. And if you make it from biomass materials, from land, you just need huge amounts of land. Right. I think in the end, we're going to, we the world, are going to decide that biofuels are a good option. Okay. But we'll never see biomass replace petroleum. It'll never sure. happen. Right.